So again, we have our special guest speaker, Tim Schuler, the New Jersey State Acreist and uh, judges for the uh, for many uh, contests, including uh, the 100 County Fair, where he's judged a lot for as long as I've been involved, and hopefully will continue forever. So very. <laughs> he ain't doing very, that. I'm telling you that right what's now. That? Jim, he's not continuing forever. Well, well, for as long as I'm around. Well, maybe as long as you're president. Yes, and as long as I take you to lunch. So. Ixnay on the lunch egg. Um, <laughs> Ixnay on the lunch We are so doing that this year. So, um, it's Isn't really it strange how he wins. It's, um, I haven't won yet. Oh, yeah. 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 You know, you have to like bribe for like years, I guess. So um, again, we're fortunate to have him here. I ain't selling my soul for lunch. I'm telling you that right now. So um, listen up because if you want to win, do what he tells you. Okay. Well, thank you, folks. It's good to be here with you today. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I was asked by Fran and Stan, I think, to maybe give just a, just some pointers or tips on things that you can do um, if you're going to enter your, your, your honey in a honey show. There's some things that, that I see that are chronically wrong all the time. The whole idea um, about showing honey is to demonstrate the best possible packaging and product that you possibly can, okay? A, a, a show winner of honey is not necessarily the honey that you want to eat, okay? It's like if you go to a livestock show, they groom that animal to make it look perfect when in fact it's not perfect, okay? It's the same thing when you're showing honey. We're looking, I'm looking as a judge for certain things, okay? The first thing you're going to need to do that most people don't do, whether it's treating for mites, or whether it's assembling something you purchased off Amazon.com, is you need to read the directions, okay? Every honey show there is has directions, has rules for the show. And they state specific things. And if you violate those specific things up front, as a judge, we don't even judge your honey. Because if you're not in the right size container, if you don't have the right closures, if you put a label on and you're not supposed to have a label on, you, 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 were, you shot yourself in the foot before you even got out of the gate, okay? So it's important to read the show, the fair regulations, all right? Most every fair I've ever attended or judged, if you're going to show extracted honey, it needs to be in a one-pound glass jar, either clean line or this is a gamber. All these are called gamber jars, one pound, okay? And you're going to need three of them and they need to be, to be three of the same kind of honey. One can't have half amber and then light on top of it. You're gonna get killed on points for that. You want it all to look the same, okay? The object is to see if you can pack multiple um, packs that all look good, all right? So we check all three of them, and you're gonna want three um, one-pound jars. The other thing is most fairs tell you that they have a class for light, light amber, amber and dark, or light, amber, and dark, or white, light, amber, and dark. So you're gonna wanna put them in a classification, and that's okay, but I'm gonna classify them. Okay, I'm gonna break them ba based on where the breaks are supposed to be, and sometimes you may have two entries that end up in one class. What I generally do in that case is I would judge them both, and we would keep your one that had the highest score. Okay, because I think that's that's fair and that's reasonable. The way we judge them or break them up into colors is by using this uh, Jack's color scale, which just gives me um, an idea. Is I just match these up based on these these colors, uh, and then that's how we put them into light, medium, and dark categories. Okay, so it's a standard. There's some, there's some subjective judgment on my part, but generally that's how I try to do it, okay? Thank you. This is what we made up for our local fair. I don't know if you want to glance at it. I will. So then we break them into the different classes, and then we will start to judge them. What some people do is they will go through cases of these trying to get rid of imperfections, like try to find the ones that are the, are the nicest color that don't have any imperfection, okay? It's important for you to wash your jars. 
but I'm going to tell you right now that if you dry them with a tea towel, you're going to have lint all over them and they're going to look terrible. The best way is to wash these jars with hot water, possibly in the dishwasher, and then take them out, put them on the rack in your oven on low, and let the oven dry them. That way there's no lint in them, and there's no kind of dust or whatever that gets in there, and, and, um, and that gets them nice and dry and nice and clean, okay? Just put that oven on low. <coughs> the other thing is, you have a choice of what kind of caps, plastic caps or metal caps, all right? Um, quite frankly, as a judge, I try not to, I try not to hold this against you, but plastic caps, they do not make a ringing sound. They don't sound clean when they come off, okay? They sound kind of dull and crappy in my opinion. Metal, metal lids, if, if the threads are clean, they have a nice, clean, crisp ring to them when they come off, and it makes me as a judge feel that you paid more attention to details. I'm just telling you, and keep in mind, all judging is is one person's opinion on one particular day, right? So don't be broken hearted if you don't get first place because it's just, I might have been having a bad day. Maybe you really did have a first place after that, right? He doesn't have bad days. Uh, I know some other Unless people you could ask that. Unless the wine explodes in front of them. Oh, that was a bad day. So I got to tell, I gotta tell you the funny story. Last year, we're at the Hundred and County Fair. That was Hundred and County Fair. I'm there, I got my box, you see this box? All my judging junk goes in this. Box is sitting next to me, I'm at the table, and it's me judging time. Well, I don't really like judging me that much, because um, some most mead, most mead I'm saying, it isn't worth drinking, in my opinion. <laughs> um, so I start opening them up, I taste a little taste, spit it out, blah, 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 do the judging, we come to this one thing, and I screw that thing in, and it explodes. <gasps> and it shoots up, it hits the tent, it rains down all oh. over me, and it, and it rains down all in my box of oh, judging God. gear, because the oh, lid was God. open. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, what in the world just happened? <laughs> I smell like a brewery. <laughs> I'm sticky. I hate sticky. Oh. I hate sticky. And you had a doctor's appointment. I had a doctor's appointment that night. Oh, no. <laughs> if I don't get arrested driving home in a state truck and lose my job. <laughs> Seriously. So, and then we had somebody help clean the box out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Every drop came out of that jar. I, I don't even know how it happened. It was like this uh, compressed so volcano exploded all over me. And Franz were looking at me with her jaw hanging over. Me. So that's a funny story. Covered. Covered. Tim, back to the mead that exploded. That's still judgeable? Because wasn't it from the judging Yeah, I judged it real good. <laughs> No ribbon for you. <laughs> Don't enter next year either. No, no, I'm just kidding. It's a suit well, Nazi for right Seinfeld, right? No yeah. suit for you. Yeah. What's that? I was right next to you, so I, I saw Did you it. get wet? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> but you didn't have a doctor's appointment. No. <laughs> I didn't get wet. No, Stan didn't get wet. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, so I don't, I don't remember. I think I don't remember if we judged it or not. I think you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah I might have. Did. I don't think so. No, uh, there was I, nothing left to judge. It was all in his. It was, was <laughs> about this much. I remember you tasted it, and. Uh, don't don't say what I said. Yeah. If I said anything. That's why I, won't I don't remember it being judged. But that, that that's the first time that ever happened, and it was an eye-opening experience. Okay, so you want your jars clean. You want your honey. Um, even after you filled your jars and you put your lids on, right? You're gonna have fingerprints on here. You're gonna wanna use some way to get that clean. Sometimes honey dribbles on it. There's nothing worse as a judge than picking it up and seeing like honey that wasn't completely wiped off, still stuck to the outside of the jar. I can't stand my fingers to be sticky. Yeah, yeah. My friend helped me in my honey house sometimes and he's dribbling all over the floor. I said, dude, 
what are you doing? He says, oh, my God, what, are you going to break the bank? Your two drops went on the floor. I said, if you step in that, everywhere you step has got honey all over the floor. I said, if you drip it, wipe it up. It wipes up with water very easily. And you know what? If you get honey on the jar, dust will stick to it. Cat hair will stick to it. Human hair will stick to it. And all those hairs are very unsavory from a judge's perspective, even if they're on the outside, let alone if they're on the inside. You certainly don't want them on the inside. Okay? Tim, is yeah. there a certain level? Is there is a certain level. And this is something that people get wrong all the time. Honey should be filled to the top of the bottom glass ring. To the top of the ring. Not to the bottom of the ring. Okay? And believe me, when we critique some of the honey today, I'm not picking on any of you. I'm glad that some of them came the way they did. But this is grossly underfilled. The, the person who purchases this is going to think, I got ripped off. Case in point, I sell honey at the Department of Agriculture building to co-workers. A lady bought some honey in a five pound plastic container. The plastic containers, if you fill them to the top, it's more than five pounds. You have to stop them and leave that much air space. This person never bought my honey before. She didn't have the full amount. She told my secretary, well, I'm not going to pay him the four extra dollars because he cut, he cut me short on the honey. That's the perception that the consumer has. You follow what I'm saying? Yep. It's the same thing with a one pound pack. The object is for when the lid is on, for you not to see any airspace between the lid and the top of that glass ring. Okay, you want, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna do anything, you should overfill, not underfill, right? But, the, but what I look for, you will knock off points if you're not filled to the top of the ring. And I compare the jars to see if they're all equally filled. So what do you do if you overfill a little bit? You're going to take a little teaspoon and you're going to gently scoop some back up out of there. And you're going to work at it to get your levels uniform. Because uniformity is something that we judge on. There's points for that. Here's another thing. We used to just do taste. It was 20 points. Now we've broken taste into smell and flavor. When I judge for taste, or most judges will only judge if it doesn't taste like honey or if it tastes like it's been burnt, okay? Because all honeys taste different. You, you guys all know that. As long as it tastes like a natural honey, not a problem. If it tastes like pickles, because you put it in a pickle jar, it doesn't fly. If it tastes like you burned it and it's caramelized, it doesn't fly, okay? What we started doing is smelling because I noticed a lot of, I sniffed the jar, right? And if the soap wasn't properly washed out, rinsed out after you washed it, it leaves a soap smell in the jar. Even after you put the honey in, the honey doesn't smell like honey, it smells like soap. So I knock bad for that. So the jars need to be rinsed. I don't know about you guys, but my wife makes coffee every morning while I'm still sleeping in bed. When I get up, I go out to get a cup of coffee. There's nothing worse than her not rinsing out the guts of the coffee maker. Now it tastes like soap when I drink it. Do you think that starts my day off good or bad? <laughs> At least it's not sticky. It's not sticky, but I'm like, I'm going to Wawa, man. I'm out of here. <clears throat> soap is no good. It wants to smell like honey, okay? So uniformity of fill. You want it to you want it to be rinsed out well, um, and you want it to smell like honey, mm -hmm. if at all possible. All right, got a question. Let's hear it, Charlie. Okay, we got the dishwashers, and the dishwasher has this little blue stuff in there, <coughs> this blue liquid that cuts the film off of everything. Does that have a stink? I don't know because I'm going to tell you right now. My wife uses the dishwasher. I wash dishes by hand, old school. I hate dishwashers personally, right? I never load it and I never unload it. That's her baby. If it died, I would never replace it if she didn't make me replace it. When the dishes are in the sink, I wash them from hand and make sure they're properly rinsed. So I don't know, Charlie. That I don't know because I'm not a dishwasher guy. All I know is I can smell soap in a jar. You're going to lose points. Okay? Charlie, run it without anything. Run it first. I'll rinse it. Uh, okay. They just taught me something. Plastic jars are no good. Don't use plastic. You want to use glass if you're going to enter a honey shop. Um, is the honey the right moisture? Okay. 
I get all kinds of stuff about this. You know, honey has a property. If you had exposed honey on a day like today, it will actually grab moisture out of the air and pull into itself. It's hygroscopic. It will pull moisture into itself. So if you extract your honey in times of high humidity and you leave it uncovered in a humid environment, it will pull moisture into itself. Do you know that if you had supers that weren't 100% capped, and you put them into a dehumidified environment for a day, do you know that they would lose moisture? Okay. Uh, the other thing I tell people, in my opinion, if your super is, is 60 to 70% capped, and you shake a frame that's not capped and no juice comes out of it, extract the whole thing and put it in the same bucket. It'll, it'll equalize itself. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait till every cell of every frame is capped. Okay? Works better if you do it in a dehumidified environment when you extract. Once you pull it off the bees, extract it. Yeah. Don't let it sit around for two, three, four days. Yeah. Okay? It's far better to extract it because if you leave it sit, you could have wax moth issues, you could have small hive beetle issues, you could have moisture issues. All right? Honey, we want it to be below 18.5% moisture. Most of the judging sheets now um, and the bigger shows, to get the full 20 points for moisture content, that, that honey's got to be between 15.5% and 17% moisture. All right? I, I realize you don't have a lot of control over that. But what it does is it allows the judge, um, it, helps the, it helps there not to be ties, okay? Because every moisture is different, or every honey is different on the moisture, all right? So Tim, what are the hints if it is too much moisture and you jarred it, what's the best thing to do? Uh, one thing you could do is you could put your jars in the oven at about 100 degrees mm -hmm. and leave them sit there for a little while. That will help to dry, drive it off. If it's in your bottling bucket, or if you have a, a warmer a, a bottler for uh, dispensing the honey, and it's in a dehumidified environment, it will lose some moisture then as well. Okay, so those are those are two options. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions about moisture? How would you know? Yeah. Thank you. Well, how I'm going to I'm going to show you what I do is I test it with an instrument called a refractometer. And what this does is this, I put a drop of honey on here. We're gonna, we're gonna test the moistures up here. We're gonna read the line. I'll let you look at what it is. This, there's, there's different types of refractometers. This refractometer has, a, has a, a thermometer on the bottom of it that tells me to either add or subtract points based on the ambient temperature, all right? We've had issues in the past where people bring their honey to the state honey show or someone transported it left it in a vehicle overnight when it's 30 degrees out. The honey is extremely cold. You can't get a good reading because it's too cold, the instrument's warm, and it screws everything up, which is one of the reasons that the honey is generally delivered to the state honey show the day ahead of time. It sits in a, in a warm building, and everything is judged at the same temperature the next day so that we don't have those kind of issues, okay? So temperature can have, can, can, can have a problem, can make a problem. Um, if you've been doing it for a while and if you've been keeping bees for a while, you turn the jar upside down and you can watch how fast the bubble rises. That'll give you an idea if it's, if it's real wet. When I take a toothpick and I'll put it in and pull it out, it almost, the drop won't stay on the toothpick. It comes right off. It's probably too wet. Okay. So as much capped as possible, dehumidified environment. Un extract your honey and get it into jars, um, et cetera, et cetera, will help deal with the moisture problem. Yes, Bob? Tim, I just wanted to let everybody know, so the club does have a refractometer. Oh. If you'd like to borrow it, okay, you can call me, Bob Floss. My name is on the uh, the website, so and I'll show you how to use it before you take it away. So this way you can test your honey and make sure it's similar to the one that Tim has. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So moisture... Kristen. Yes. It, it, and not, not really for showing, but will it crystallize faster if there's more moisture in it? Is that, are they related? I'm not sure about that, but um, 
honey crystallizes based on the size of the sugar molecule and how many other things are in the honey and also based on where you store it if you store it in a warm environment it's not going to be any problem mm -hmm. if you store it in a cool environment in the say 40s and 50s it's going to crystallize much quicker mm -hmm. one of the best ways to liquefy honey that's already in a container is put it on the dashboard of your car on a hot day and it will liquefy just like that even in March it'll liquefy like that people get all crazy about heated honey okay um, is your honey heated if you've ever tried to bottle honey 60 degree honey takes forever to bottle okay? and, and, and the other thought that comes to my mind is what is the temperature inside of a beehive okay if you have a brood minder, I heard the word brood minder several times, they have a temperature sensor. And the brood minders that I have, temperature can go up to 110 degrees in that high. Okay? So in my opinion, if honey's heated at 100 degrees, it's no big deal because it's the same thing that the bees have inside there. But American marketing at its best says if you heat honey, you're evil, no good, adulterator of honey. But it's not true. Okay? Because honey's that hot anyway. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, perfect sense. Heated honey, if there's if there's sugar molecules or if it starts to crystallize, um, a little bit of heat will turn those sugar molecules back to liquid again. Okay, and some floral sources will crystallize more readily because the molecule is larger in size. Um, another one of my pet peeves is really raw honey. Okay. Well, your honey's not crystallized, so it must not be raw. Oh, yeah. Crystallized honey doesn't get spun out of the comb, okay? It stays in the comb. Right. Um, people that, 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 my wife says that's American marketing at its best because it has the consumer of, the, of, of a very highly educated country thinking that crystallized honey is raw honey. In my opinion, the only raw honey is honey in the comb, i.e. comb honey. Comb honey is not touched by human hands except cut into a square. Mm -hmm. Um, so, from my perspective, that's raw honey. The rest of it is just semantics, okay? That's why it's important to ask questions when people use certain terminology, because I don't know what they're talking about, right? We're asked that question a lot at the fairs. Of is course. this raw honey? Of course. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's from the hive to the extractor to the jar. Is it is it unfiltered honey? It has honey? no eyes and legs in it. It must be filtered a little bit, you know, but that's if that's what you want, that's what you're getting. So, a, a lady came to my wife and says, oh, I want honey with... Um, I want unfiltered honey, and Patty says, well, unfiltered honey has bee wings and bee legs in it and crap like that and wax, yeah. and the lady says, that's what I want. And Patty says, okay, so she came home that night, took a quart jar, we threw some cappings and a couple of dead bees in it, screwed the lid on and took it back to the next farmer's market. Guess what? She never came back. So you know what we say now? Uh, no honey for you. Next person in line, please. Okay, because I don't buy that yeah. stuff. It's a bunch of baloney. Yeah, what do they always say? Is this raw honey? I said, yeah, yeah, it's raw. You're gonna get it. I mean, it's not heated or anything, you know. It's just uncooked, right? Yeah. Okay, Robert. So how would you say that in two sentences when we're at the fair when somebody says, "Is this raw honey? Yeah. I'm looking for honey with pollen." Here's how here's what I say. How okay. do you define raw honey? Uncooked. I put it back on them. Dead. Unheated. I said, well, this honey's heated because you couldn't afford it. If I had to have pay somebody to put it in the bottle at 60 degrees, okay, it would it would take all afternoon to do one case. And what do you think the temperature is in a beehive? It's 100 degrees on a regular basis. So if the honey's heated to 100 degrees, what's the big deal? It's not heated any worse than the bees heated. You can tell them this is not heated to 160 degrees and and, and filtered under a high pressure filter to remove every little bit. Uh, that's in there. Do you know why large honey packers do that? Does anybody know why they do that? I know one packer to bring their temperature up to 180 degrees. Oh. 180, I, I said, wow, 180. I said, well, we know why the Chinese I'll, do it. I won't mention the name who it is, but it's a big packer. The reason it's done is if you are selling honey to a supermarket chain, I don't care what supermarket chain it is, that honey gets put into a warehouse for distribution as needed, okay? So that pallet or two or five of honey might be sitting in a warehouse that is only heated to maybe 50 degrees or 45 degrees. 
The packer does not want the honey to crystallize in there. That's why they want to filter all the bits of pollen and all the large sugar molecules and wax out of it. Because if it gets crystallized there, then they have to take it back, liquefy it, and bring it back again. And that causes problems. That's why they heat it and put it under a pressurized filter. You, if you're doing it in your backyard, don't have to do that. I would suggest you strain it through one of those filters we saw earlier, or we use a window screen. That's really all you need to do to get the big stuff out of it. If you want to be successful at a honey show, you know what works great? A knee-high nylon stocking that's not been used before. <laughs> Crush out of the bag. Make sure you smell it. You don't want it smelling like, um, you know, burnt nylon or something like that. And it works really great. It has a very fine mesh. And the nice thing I like about it is when you get down to the end, you can pull it up, tie a knot in it, and hang it from a hook and let the last little bit of it drain out. That honey will be extremely clean once it goes through a nylon knee-high stocking. Okay? And it's simple and it's cheap. I don't know what they are, 50 cents or a dollar? Okay? Very good <coughs> honey filter. Throw it away and use a new one next time. Okay? Um, so that works great for getting bits and particles out of your jar. The other thing is, we sometimes we see a tremendous amount of foam. If you try to take honey from a bottling container, which might be a five gallon bucket with a honey gate on the bottom, or might be the bottom of an extractor or a stainless steel tank with no heat, okay? The honey gets cooled, and as it drops into your jar and wiggles all around, it's pulling air into it. Cold honey will not give up air bubbles very quickly. Finally, the air bubbles rise to the top, and now you'll see foam, like frothy foam on a beer, all around the top of the jar. It's not appealing to the consumer or the judge, okay? So if the honey is a little on the warm side when you put it into your bottles, you have much less of that air in there. If you pack your, your containers, and you, I would suggest you make them a little on the overfilled side, let the foam rise to the top, and then you can take a little um, spoon, teaspoon, and skim those things off as you come down to your proper level. And eat it. Okay? You can eat it, but don't double dip. That's no good. <laughs> I love guacamole, right? But I'm like, I saw you double dip over there. No guacamole for you. This is a great thing, but if you're the judge, it's a real pain. I would suggest if you're gonna come to the fair with your entry and you bring it like this, that you take off the lid and you take the cellophane off so I don't have to do it. Because the cellophane comes off, it drips. If there's honey on it, and it's, sticky. it can be a mess and then the jar is sticky and I ain't happy about that <laughs> that's going to make a frown from a smile okay so um, there's people that do that probably the better way to go would be to put the lid on and then when you get to the fair just switch lids with a new lid in case it gets tilted a little bit okay so, so honey on the lid makes a difference yeah okay. it's better if the honey if the lids clean all right um, it's better if the threads ring when they come off. Let's see how this one is. Yeah, it's nice and dry. Let's see. <laughs> Looks like a winner from here. You hear that noise? Yep. Yeah, that's the noise. That's a good noise. <laughs> What's the purpose of putting and the cellophane And that fill height looks it? good, Tim. It's to try to keep the inside of the lid from getting yeah. honey on it. <coughs> see, that, that lid's clean. Got it. You know what else people don't inspect inside their lids? I inspect them all the time dust in the lid, mm -hmm. yeah. not, a pen, not paying attention to details. Yeah. Yeah. You want the lids clean. If there's something in there you can't get rid of, use a different lid. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Listen to this. <laughs> Don't. No. No. That doesn't sound crisp and square and fresh, does it? No. 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 Sounds nasty. How's the fill height on that? Fill height's terrible. Too high? Uh, a little bit too high. Fill height's probably not that bad but there's stuff on top okay is this yours Charlie no okay <laughs> <laughs> no, mine's the lower one mine's the uh, underfill oh. somebody skanked a teaspoon out of it I think I found that in yours Charlie was that in yours <laughs> was that a cat hair <laughs> oh my god no it's a bee I'll tell you a funny story 
the second state apiarist in the state of the New Jersey was named Paul Holcomb. He got the position in about the, the 30s through like the 50s. And his tactic was he would have a couple of mashed bees in his pocket, they'd go to the cafe for lunch, eat three quarters of their lunch, and then throw a bee on it and say, oh my God, you're, you have bugs in this place. And they say, oh, please, no, no, no charge for you. And out he'd go. That, that's what the state relegates employees to do. Okay? It's kind of like, the, of like tequila when you have a the worm. Yeah, except it's not as appealing as tequila with a pickled worm in the middle of it. Yeah, the worm don't get you stoned. But he has to be at the bottom. Okay, so when we take our lid off, I'm listening for the ring, looking for dirt, looking to see if there's a lot of honey up on the threads, checking for foam, checking for foam. and then I like to take my flashlight and I like to look and see what's floating on top because wax will rise to the top, little tiny bits of wax, little tiny bits of pollen, um, some dirt will rise to the top and with a nice light you can really see what's there. I remember last year in Hunter and you opened a jar and found a hair in one. And oh, you were not yeah. <laughs> well, I don't taste. I don't taste jars that have hair in. Them. Uh, no way. <coughs> oh, that's. Yeah. It was. It was like we want to look the hair. Oh, <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> no, you said that there was stuff on the top of that one a when little, you first little opened bit, it up. A little bit. Did that come from the cellophane that you couldn't clean before you put it on? Because that's the one that had the cellophane on it in between the... Right. Well, the cellophane should have been clean. I don't yeah, know. It should, it should have been, but you don't know how long it was sitting in the cabinet. That's you true. Know? Now, like this this one, there's dust on top of the lid. I would hold that against them, too. This one has drips on the side of the jar. Okay? All that stuff needs to be cleaned off if you want to get high, high scores. And I'm not saying this to pick on anybody, Charlie. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you just happen to be the judge. <laughs> But those are things that I look for. Well, we didn't one. know you was also the jury and executioner. <laughs> no, I'm not, no, 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 I'm not execution or anything. <clears throat> Warming, I already talked about that. All three jars uniform, knee-high stocking, 100 degrees, don't use a towel. Here's some things not to do. Do not strain honey through cheesecloth. Cheesecloth, no good. It will put lint like crazy in your honey. It's going to look bad. Okay, no cheesecloth. Don't use plastic jars. Keep hair out of honey. <laughs> Do not leave honey uncovered in high humidity areas. Do not dry jars with towel. Deliver your entry yourself. Because you, want, cause you know what? You don't know if somebody did this to your entry. Yeah. Yeah. I will say one thing uh, is we do for those folks who can't make it down to the Hunterdon County Fair, you know, you can bring it, I think, to Charlie or Stan or to Bob or to me. And if you bring it to us in good shape, we will diligently get it to Tim yeah. in good shape. Get we'll take that responsibility. So if you can't get it and, and, and take it to the fairgrounds, we'll help with that. Okay? One time but, at a fair. Let but me I'm not cleaning your jars and, and, and adjusting your fills you know for you. So. At one time, Jim, we were at a fair. And a consumer came by and picked it up and said, oh, what's this? <gasps> Before it was judged. Oh. So that kind of stuff can happen too. But well, I was just gonna if say, that happened, I wouldn't hold it against you. As a volunteer, I did it once. I picked up a jar I out of the box. I thought that was a consumer. No, no. I, you weren't there that day. It wasn't there, it wasn't, but I did pick it up. And I was like, oh, what is this? They're like, no, that's not even the fair. I didn't know. So if you're volunteering, don't touch the jar. <laughs> What's the best way to transport your honey to the shop? Oh, that's a great question. I'm going to tell you, the best way to transport it is in a honey box. You know what a honey box is? What you bought the jars? It's a case that you bought these jars in. Okay? And what some people do is they'll they'll get their entry ready, they'll slip it an old sock, or a, a clean sock, over it. <laughs> and set it down in there and then box it so that they don't <coughs> fall over in transit. It's much easier to keep the box upright. It's a good idea to write your name, phone number on the box so that whoever is doing the, the check-ins knows that that's your entry, okay? Um, and they will like pull it out of the sock, not touch it, etc., etc. Okay, that, that's probably the best way to transport it. At the State Honey Show, I mean, guys, 
We get people, oh, they had a six-pack of Heineken. They put their honey entries in, a, in three of the slots of a Heineken six-pack flimsy box that's collapsing the whole time. Don't do that. Get a honey box, right? I'm sure Stan's got them laying around. He'd probably give them to you, especially if you bought something, right? Yes? And from physics' point of view, keep in mind the centrifugal force. Take sharp turn. The jars, basically, even though they are, they are straight, mm -hmm. the honey will just squeeze yeah. out. Yeah, we stu stuff paper in the holes so no, it no, gives no, it no, reinforced. No. I mean, honey, honey, honey itself. Oh, it's honey itself. Right. I got you. Drive slower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're transporting something you worked hard on. You don't want to screw it up at the end. Okay? I, I'll say one other thing. On behalf of all honey show people who run these shows, who do a spectacular amount of work to do them, pick up your honey. They get stuck with honey that people don't retrieve. And they're beekeepers. They don't, they don't necessarily want to go home with this stuff. It amazes me, like the state show that happened recently I brought home honey for somebody who left it and I brought home honey and I kept it because people didn't know whose it was it wasn't labeled to Tim's point nobody knew nobody wanted it so if you have the decency to enter the show make sure you show up on the last day and pick it up don't saddle the people running the show with your honey and if you don't have if you don't value your product or have pride in it nobody else is going to value it or have pride in it either okay so all these things, we're looking to have a good, high-quality product that a consumer would want to buy. Having a honey show at a fair stimulates conversation with the non-beekeeping public. Um, it gives you opportunity to talk about reading the label and trying to determine if, was the honey from the U.S. or was it imported from China by way of three other countries? Um, did it say just honey syrup or does it say 100% pure honey on it? You know, these are all ways that you can consume or that you can educate the public. It's always a good idea to encourage uh, people to buy honey from a beekeeper that they know or a, a local person, okay? So if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Becky? Um, I pulled some honey off uh, yesterday and it's completely trapped. I probably won't get around to pulling it out until tomorrow, but it's in a warm place. So is it okay. dehumidified in its area? It's, it's neither humidified or not. It's just neutral. Okay. It's all is that all right? Yeah, that should be fine. Okay. Yep. Yes. Should Rich. You keep honey in the freezer? Capped honey? You can keep capped honey in the freezer. If you're going to display honey as, as, a, as a comb capped, or you're going to make comb honey, it should be put in the freezer so that any wax moth eggs are destroyed. Um, but it really needs to be in its display case or in its container it's going to be marketed in. Then it need, those containers need to be put inside of a plastic bag. Then it's put in the freezer. And when you pull it out, you allow it to come up to room temperature in its bag. So condensation will form on the outside rather than on the inside. The last thing you want to have is a frame of beautiful honey in a, in a display case that's loaded with condensation dripping down over the face of the caps. We don't want that, okay? The other thing you don't want is to take it to the show and not have treated it for wax moss by freezing it, and then all of a sudden during the show, wax moth larvae are eating your, your honey out. That's gonna turn people off the honey because they're gonna think there's maggots in it. Is that worse than hair? That's, well, it's not for me. Hair still works. I'd rather eat a wax worm than, than hair, anything, okay? Something about hair, man, it just skeeves me out. It's like people touching my toes. I don't really like that either. Did you just talk about what else you judge at these shows, at the honey shows? Well, I do judge meat if it doesn't explode and give me a shower. We judge beeswax. Okay, beeswax is a great thing to enter if you have it. A block of bee, one pound block is a great way to go. But you need to clean it properly. Okay, because beeswax, you can really see a lot of um, a lot of dirt and stuff like that in it very easily. Um, beeswax can its smell can be screwed up if it's cooked too much, or if it's um, <coughs> put into a container that has other aromas. Um, we judge photography. I'm not real good at photography because um, I'm not a creative, artsy fartsy person. Um, but I do the best I can. Okay. 
Uh, and I can only, I can tell when sometimes when it's not in focus, but not always. Um, what else? Creamed honey. Lip balm and lip balm cosmetics. In case you can't tell, I'm not a cosmetics kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> Absorption and sticky residue. I really don't like anything on me, but I the all the ladies that are there love watching me do it. Okay? <laughs> I don't like smelly stuff. I only use dial soap. I don't use anything else. Right? So, okay. yeah. Yes, Charlie. Now when you go to do um, a frame of honey, I mean a frame of uh, wax, comb honey? Comb honey. Comb honey. Okay. Mainly white wax, uh, nice and capped uniformly. And it's got a little bit of off-color stuff in there. What do you look for? The number of holes or the number of uncapped? Oh, some of what we look for is is their travel stain on the caps because nice white caps, if you leave them in a hive too long, will not be white anymore. They will start to change color. Just like if you had a white carpet in your living room, not going to stay white for very long. Okay. Um, I look for uncapped cells or cells with no honey in it. I look for honey drizzling down the side of, of the display case. Many display cases, the frame just sits in there and it rocks back and forth inside its container. That is not good. The best kind of display case has you can, where you can put a little screw on both sides to hold the frame rigid inside it. Some of them even have a wooden notch. Okay. Um, we want the honey to all be the same color. For example, we don't want um, clover honey in the same frame as Japanese knotweed honey because that is a big markup and it's it, uh, it, two different colors in the same frame is not that good. Okay, you'll lose points for that. Um, so those are some of the things, Charlie. If there's wax moths and stuff like that, yeah. of course you're going to lose a lot for that. Just look it up. Rich. Does it, does it have to be um, naturally drawn? Can it be plasma foundation? No. I, th uh, I think the frame can be plastic foundation. But cut comb has to be a uh, comb foundation. Yeah, I think the frame can be plastic. Yeah, for sure. Pollen, you'll lose points for pollen as well. Okay? So you want to select your frame that is the most uniform, the most similar color throughout, and doesn't have pockets of pollen in there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? The wax. Is there any particular shape it has to be in? Is it exactly one pound? It needs to be, the, the, there's a class for one pound block, that needs to be one pound. Square, rectangle, doesn't make doesn't difference. matter as long as it's one pound. And there's also candles, there's um, figurines, and they don't have as many uh, restrictions. That's why it's important to read the fair rules, because as the judge, I'm going to read the fair rules, and I'm going to strictly adhere to them. Yeah. Uh, no labels on the jars. Depends on the fair. The state honey show has labels on it because part of that whole thing is to promote um, honey from different parts of the state. Because as, as assemblymen and senators walk by it, they say, hey, there's people that keep bees in my constituency. And that is a good thing. I entered the honey show for the first time in 1987, state honey show. The then mayor and assistant mayor, who happened to still be the mayor and assistant mayor of my town, saw me somewhere and said, we saw Richland, New Jersey at the State House, or in the Capitol Rotunda, and your name was on the jar. And I said, yeah, that's because I entered the State Honey Show. Man, that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. They thought that was wonderful. Well, guess what? If they want to have a problem, if there's a problem with bees in my town, you know who they come to? <laughs> me. If they're going to pass an ordinance in my town or try to do something or have an issue with honeybee problems in my town, they come to me. That means I get to influence them in, in a positive light, not in a negative light. Okay, that's another reason you should all participate in the State Honey Show. Because I'm sure you got politicians from this area down there that need to know that there are beekeepers from their place that maybe vote for them or could vote for them. Right? It's all good. You just talk quickly about your polariscope. You didn't, so people may not know what that thing is. Yeah, you guys can come up afterwards. This is a polariscope here. This has a, you know, a light box. Kevin, I'm, I guess I'm sorry, I got my back to you. It's okay. Is that store bought or is that uh... No, this was made by a member of this club named J.D. Ditson, who's long dead. Um, he lived up on, off a of tunnel road. That's right. 
Asbury. Is that Asbury? Yeah, yeah, Bethlehem Township. Bethlehem Township, right there. Joke Time Mountain. He was a great guy. I'll tell you an interesting story about him. He was like a detail guy. Like he must have been a rocket scientist or a chemist or something like that. He was I think smart. he was. I think he was some kind of chemist or something, yeah. And, uh, you know. He was all ran. Is that where he was? Yeah, he was an engineer or something. Engineer or something, yeah. So, in his house, every year he kept bees, he had a one pound jar of honey with the, the date, the year that honey was harvested all around his living or his family. Right? And I was born in 1960. This guy was like probably a year or two before he was going to die. And I was over at his house and he says, when were you born? I said, 1960. He pulled it down off the shelf and gave it to me. And it's 1960. And this was in like 1989, right? 60, 70, 80. It's like 29 years old, okay? I felt very honored by that. I will tell you, this honey will get dark with time just because it ages, but it's still good to eat. It may not look nearly as light as it does today. All his honey looks pretty darn dark, and I think it's because it oxidizes over time. What this box does is it allows me to look through here. There are two photo, photo films that make the light become polarized, so it picks up any defect in the honey. When I put this down, I use an LED light box, or an LED light bulb, 100 watt light bulb in here. And as that light shines through there, when you look in, you will see crystals, you will see wax, you'll see things that you would not see with the naked eye. You'll see hairs. It's a little difficult in an environment like this because you see pollen, because you're going to have glare from outside. It's better if you're in a dark room when you do it. That's why if you ever come to the fair, I have a, a black plastic garbage bag that I pull over my head like I'm taking a picture yeah. back in 1930. <laughs> and that's so that I can see in there without the glare hitting me from the sides. Use it when you're doing the mead next time. Well, no, I'll, I'll, wear my, I'll bring my rain gear when I do the mead next time. <laughs> that's a point that uh, if you want to see Tim in action doing this, he'll be at the Hunter and County Fair this year. And, the, and, it, and it's always done the morning, the morning of the first day which will be Wednesday, August 23rd. And if you show up at eh, 11 or so, you should be uh, getting started by then and you can see the whole process. And, and uh, you know, you're welcome to come. So. Yeah, you're also welcome to come to the Warren Fair too. And, yeah. I, and I will tell you, you're also welcome to come to the Sussex County Fair and enter the show there. <laughs> okay, only Sussex County people enter it, but they pay money and give ribbons and they have a pretty good show. And I think it'd be cool if people from other counties went up there and whooped their hind part. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that be good? Yeah. yeah. That, that's the state. That's the state. That's, that's the state, state fair, fair, right? Yeah. Sussex County? Yeah, what we'll do yeah. is yeah. we'll yeah. get a, we'll get a shuttle and yeah. take honey up there. That's what we'll do. Uh, we'll the people in up. Northeast are, are going to be going there. Because uh, last year, a new beekeeper, Bobby Vitale, from Bergen County, took his honey entry up there, entered it, and won a ribbon. Dude was a stack. So he told everybody in his club, you guys, he wrote a big article. You should come to the Sussex County Fair and enter their show, right? <laughs> so now they're gonna have a whole a whole uh, train load of cars bringing their entries over to the Sussex County Fair, I think. So if you wanna come up here, it's kinda hard for me to do it, but we can look in, in the lids. You guys can look in this box and we can do some, um, some, uh, refract. refract.